It is uh, 7.31. I call this meeting um, of the RTM Finance and Budget Committee to order. I'm going to, um, if there's no objection, I want to change some of the order of the meeting. Um, and um, we're going to do one thing real quick if we can. And then I want to go instead of the presentation on HHR, um, I want to talk about debt first in its totality. So Jen can go back to her normal life instead of an evening with us. Um, so, um, but I think that's going to be a very big topic over the next couple of weeks or months. So, um, Peter, do you want to go and um, talk about um, what we are intending to do on the um, at the RTM? Um, okay, I thought we weren't going to talk about that, but that's okay. Um, uh, you give just a brief to, overview. Yeah, this is very simple. Um, uh, is, is there are people who have felt um, uh, the need to express uh, some sense of uh, a, a strong sense of support for both the Board of Ed um, and the, the Board of Selectmen, the town as a whole, for some of the recent things that have, uh, recent tragic events that have happened. And so we, we're uh, preparing a, a very brief draft um, uh, statement uh, of actually would be a, a sense of the meeting vote for the January 6th, excuse me, January, uh, 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 June 6th meeting. And um, you'll see this uh, 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 in due course when we uh, bring it. But just, it, it's essentially, it's, a, it's an RTM expression of support and solidarity with the, the, the rest of the town uh, after a lot of these, the, the, these tragic events that have hit us in the past weeks and, and months. And, so. and it's in, in support of their support of um, pursuing um, solutions for mental health and healing the community as a well. whole. Yeah. So uh, very simple, straightforward. Without getting into specifics or anything, but I think that it's uh, it's good. There have been um, the board of ed has um, has had a very rough time in what some people have been writing to them. Um, but it's it's something that um, you know you know that I have a bipolar son, so it's something that I deal with on an ongoing basis um, of understanding what this possibly can be. So anyhow, I just wanted to address that. From that, um, I want to go and talk a little bit about the day. And let's see if I can do a screen share. Uh, okay, good enough. Um, and is yeah, meeting screen share. Okay, so during um, one of the things that are done for all the debt is that we do have a, an estimate prepared by our um bond advisors for what the debt will be. And one of the charts that we're going to be dealing with this later, but there's three tranches of um, debt that will be issued. Um, while we're voting on each of the three resolutions separately, when we issue the debt, we can combine the debt. But obviously, it'll be based upon what funding they need and go from there. But um, there's pro formas that have been issued that talk about what the pay down is. But I wanted to spend some time really on this chart. Some modification of this we talked about at the um, budget meeting, where we showed that over the next five years, approximately um, $30 million of debt will be paid off. If you go from um, at the end of this fiscal year, it's about 86 million. Um, the end of next year, it's about 76, and it's going to drop precipitously over that. And as you can see, the um, payments are going where we've been averaging about 10, 11 um, for our debt service. Um, by 2029, we would have been at uh, 5 million. And one of the things the Board of Finance has been doing 
is based upon whether or not they skip principal up front or whether or not um, how they arrange these um, debt services is to try and keep the debt service equal over the time. So when I looked at this chart, I realized this only dealt with the 77.5 million. That was um, the three new debts that we're going to be talking about later. It didn't deal with the 1.3, which is um, three other little bonds, the completion of the fiscal year 23 budget process. It also didn't deal with, after they do some cleanup, about 18 million of um, authorized but unissued debt, um, some of which, um, about 9 uh, million of which is associated with Ox Ridge, um, will not be um, issued for debt. And um, part of that is, um, you know, and, and even in this analysis that I'm showing you now, is that it doesn't have any grant money in there. It calculates no premium being offered. And if we look at Ox Ridge, two of the tranches had significant premium. And when the grant came in, and I believe it's about 8% of what they're getting, that's used to um, pay down debt service um, or is used for the building itself. And hence, we're never issuing debt service. So um, I asked Jen to join us so that if there was any, you know, that first of all, she can give a better explanation than what I just did. Um, as I joke that I read the Bonding for Dummies book. Um, and um, I know we do have some bonding experts here, but um, I thought that Jen was would be in a better position to answer any of this than um, I am. So, Jen, please take over, explain what I didn't say right, uh, add what you think should be added. Well, understanding that a lot of this is the Board of Finance's job, but it's worthwhile. You have Jen here for some time. If there's questions, perfect time to ask. So, yeah, overall, Jack, I think you summarized it very well. Um, this is just our our best guess. Right now, it is a complete guess projection on when we think we'll issue and how much. We're expecting three equal issues, but it's really going to be dependent on the cash flow of the project. Um, typically, what we do is because we have such a sizable fund balance, we have the luxury of um, being able to spend money and then we issue bonds and reimburse ourselves as well as some forward projection of what we're going to spend in the next year to 18 months. Um, but initially getting underway with just the architectural and the design work and really until the construction gets going, we would front that from the general fund and then we'll, right now we're expect, we're thinking we'll do an issue in about a year um, for around $25 million as our first round for this um, set of renovations. Jack, may Is I that, say something? You can say whatever you want, Bert. Okay. Um, and you know I never hold back. So well, then I should um, qualify that. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's terrific that we're trying to even out the debt service over the next few years or forever. <clears throat> other than for some adjustments for, you know, emergency funding and and uh, maybe inflation. But if we were to uh, have a more level debt service over the next few years, wouldn't we, wouldn't we be issues bonds at a discount? Because 2023 and 2024 shows that the um, Debt service is lower than in following years. I, I want to see what Jen has to say about that. <clears throat> well, when we actually are getting ready to issue, we sit down with Board of Finance and our financial advisor and talk about the structure of the actual issue. Uh, the Board of Finance has to pass a resolution to sell. So in that discussion, 
It's, you know, what are the market conditions at that time? What is our um, debt, outstanding debt, and what is our debt service looking at that time? And they have a discussion of how they want to structure the issue. Um, so at the time that we approve the appropriation in the bonding resolution, we don't really factor that in. We make some um, assumptions, but that discussion really occurs each time we're going to go to the market to issue. Well, there's two different object, obje <clears throat> objectives. One is um, to try to keep the debt service level, but the other one is to see what the market gives us at any given time and how we structure the bonds, right? <clears throat> right. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just wanted to know how that works. Um, because um, I think it's a great objective to have about level debt service for a municipality because people will not understand if there's volatility in any of this. So I think the objective of the town of Darien is terrific. Keep it level. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen if there's a new project coming on a uh, new uh, debt coming on from a new um, investment. But right now, I think the best we can do, and I think the town has done that, to keep the debt service pretty level. <clears throat> right. If you recall, even in the budget presentation, um, well, there are some things that I might challenge the Board of Finance on periodically, how they've been handling the debt service um, managing um, the terms and keeping it up, um, knowing when to refinance um, if that comes up. I think they've done an excellent job on that. And um, that goes to our credit, uh, to their credit. And a lot of credit to Jen also does a lot of work with this with um, the bond advisor. I, there's something else that was mentioned and I think it's important to hear. The issuance of the 77.5 million and the incremental 1.3 million um, and the uh, whatever we issue of the authorized and unissued will not, it is not anticipated that that will affect our AAA credit rating. Is that a reasonable statement, Jen? Yes, that is. And I think that's important for us to understand. Um, it's one of the things. One other thing that, while I have you here, um, and, and um, I'm just going to tease, I see for Chris that one of his family members just joined him on the couch. Um, mine is over here lying down. Um, <laughs> the, um, the soft cost for issuance are embedded in the calculations that uh, David has done. And the number being used for the three projects is um, 300,000. Um, it's, uh, it's my understanding the Ox Ridge was about 311. And whatever it is, this is an estimate that was given by, I don't want to put Jen on the spot, but by Jen, that's the one we're going to be using. So unlike the other three little tiny things where we have about $3,000 added on to make those into funny little numbers, um, the reason why these are flat and even is because those costs have already been built in to the um, soft costs of each of the three projects. Is that a fair statement again? Yes, it is. Thank you. Other than putting you on the spot, so I apologize for that. Um, Jenny. Uh, just a comment to Bert um, and, and the rest of us when, when thinking about trying to achieve overall level debt service <laughs> for all issues, you it's a, a trade-off between you can defer principal to push principal out a little bit further on the curve to level it off, but you're also paying a little higher interest rate, assuming the yield is upward sloping, yield curve is upward sloping. So um, 
uh, I'm sure it's it's a right now. I think the town is um, what they typically do is they just issue bonds. I don't think we ever do capitalized interest. We actually just issue bonds and we start amortizing right away. So okay. there's things you can do to postpone amortizing a little bit, but understanding that that comes at a little potentially a little higher interest cost, debt debt service costs. And to answer your question about premium bonds versus discount bonds, I think what you're looking at overall is what the average interest cost is. Because the, as Jen pointed out, the market will dictate by the investors which maturities, and it's typically the first 10 years or to the call date, the optional redemption date, that you'll see more premium bonds. And that more has to do with the tax rule called the de minimis rule that's inside baseball. I don't need to get into that. But you might see discount bonds. You might see a combination of both premium and discount bonds. So generally speaking, I, I wouldn't get in the weeds or worry too much about why aren't we issuing discount bonds. It's really more um, you know, an overall uh, interest cost on the entire amount of the bonds that are issued. So um, in case that kind of answers your question. It does. Right. And uh, thank you for your comments. Ultimately, it, it comes down to what is a debt service? You know, what can we afford? How is it leveled out over time? I have no um, issue with what has been done, and I'm on FNB for seven years, with, and I've been watching this for seven years, how bonds have been structured with call options and so forth, or premiums and discounts, whatever. I think the um, Board of Finance and the uh, Director of Finance are doing a great job. I was just asking because um, there is some volatility now one in the market and two for the town of Darien if we expand the borrowing horizon um so i i just want to be more comfortable and so that's 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 the only thing thank you i i, I do want to add a little bit of humor to uh bert's comment of he's on f and b for seven years because i remember when he first joined and he was um sitting next to me and um in his typical german um humor um when he gave his background said i have a bit of financial knowledge and um having been married to a german citizen at the time i immediately went to linkedin because i knew that little was a heck of a lot so um <laughs> the um the um and we could joke that we may be related based upon where his family is and uh, where her family was in Germany. Um, the the other question that came up, and I understand this is a board of finance, but we typically go to market. And um, but have we considered or would we potentially consider uh, um, or is there an advantage to do private placement um, versus the going to market, Jen? Um, it's an option, and it's something that we do discuss with our financial advisor um, for each issue. But so far, competitive sale has been best for us. Um, and the issue, the issue that we just did in February, I think we had 10 bids. Um, so we generate a lot of interest. People want to buy our bonds, and they offer pretty competitive um, interest rates. Yeah, I was. I, it's, I'm glad you went back there because even though it was a bit higher than what we anticipated, we had in the budget because we thought we would issue in 2021. We, um, which which did add to the 2023 budget. Um, it also saved us money on the other end of what we had in that budget for what we were going to be doing. We still got highly competitive rates when we went out in February in the marketplace. Right. Um, and I think that's the important thing. Yes, rates went up, but we still got what one would claim in my neophyte knowledge. We still got one of the best rates that were out there. So um, I think that that's 
something that we should consider. Are there any other questions for Jen or can we set her free for the evening? Seeing none, Jen, thank you very much. I promise that Jen, should we, should we pursue as a town the project whose name cannot be mentioned because it's not on the agenda and for all those um, Harry Potter fans know what I'm talking about. Um, I promise you, Jen will be back in one of, or two of our meetings. So, <laughs> depends the on the intro, time. I'm going to be in Hawaii in June. So, uh, well, you know, um, Jen, we're virtual, so yeah, you know, we can still. <laughs> There's no Have internet. A good in Hawaii. evening. I, I can tell you. That. Exactly. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> have a very good evening, Jenny. Jen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Okay. Um, now we'll get back to the regu regularly scheduled program. Um, what I've asked for uh, Chris and David to do is to go through um, their presentation more geared to what we need. I'm going to attempt to share my screen again, um, but I have to get to that site and close off the other one that I was using. Uh, boom, it's over here. Uh, boom, over here. Okay. So, Chris, go through, and I'll um, let's see if I can yeah. I'll just I'll just slide. ask you to I'll just ask you to go to the next slide each time. Okay. Does everybody see my screen, or yes, did I messed something up. Okay, fine. Okay. Um, hi everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Price. Uh the chair of the Hindley Homes and Royal Building Committee. And I'm joined by my um, committee colleague, David Martin, who also happens to be a member of the Board of Finance. Um, I'm gonna assume optimistically that uh, folks have, have either flipped through these slides because Jack sent them around or um watched or watched either the board of selectmen or the board of finance presentations that we did <clears throat> about a week ago where we went through this presentation and and also answered questions from those two boards so some of the stuff i'm going to move through fairly quickly um so there's time for questions and you know david and i can can try to address as many as possible um the uh Next slide is just the first two slides are just the members of the committee, um, the standing members of the committee, and then the ex officio members, which are folks from the town and from the school district and from the PTO. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what the committee is charged with doing, uh, talk a little bit about the charge and some of the things that are common to all of the schools then get into some of the specifics on a school by school basis, and then um, talk about where we are in the process. And then David is gonna talk with more specificity about um, how we calculated the amount of the requested appropriation for each of the schools. Um, so the building committee charge, this is from, um, this is from August of 2021. The key words in here are um, that the building committee is being stood up to renovate, to supervise the renovation in accordance with um, approved educational specs of the three of the three elementary schools. And the, edu the educational specs were approved by the Board of Education in May of 2021. Uh, next slide. What that charge means when you boil it down is um, really look, you know, again, tied to the ed specs, eliminating the temporary classrooms at all of the schools, renovating or replacing 
um, existing libraries with global learning commons, right sizing a number of the classrooms and special subject classrooms like music and art. And then um, a key piece of this is upgrading outdated um, mechanical systems, electrical systems, and the building envelopes. Uh, next slide, why are we renovating and not building new schools? This is where I said a lot of this really covers all three of the schools, and these are things that the, the project has in common uh, across the three schools. Um, the good news is, is that uh, from the 2016 existing conditions survey that was commissioned, uh, it was determined that these three schools were in basically good condition, and the existing buildings were solid, and that it would ultimately be more cost effective to reno renovate and alter these schools rather than uh, tearing them down and replacing them. Obviously, the other approach was taken with Ox Ridge based on the same based on the same study. Um, a lot of that is a credit to Mike Lynch and his team um, at the school district because of the quality, the maintenance that they have undertaken and keeping the systems running. Um, these are these are older schools, um, some cases built in the 40s last renovated in 1996. So um, Mike has really done you know, has really done a terrific job. The flip side of that is the portable classrooms. Everyone agrees they need to go. They're old. They're obsolete. Um, the students, you know, for for a town like Darien, um, it's just they're not really up to the expectation that uh, that we set for our students. Uh, next slide. Uh, why do we need to renovate our libraries? That's obviously a key piece of this. Um, the Hindley and the Royal Libraries were added in the 70s. The proposal is to remove those and replace them. They're really past their useful life. The Holmes Library also needs to be renovated. Um, a big part of that is because it's adjacent to the gymnasium and it's hard to use the library while there are activities going on in the gymnasium. Um, and frankly, the way that kids use libraries are different. Um, as I noted in the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance, when I was in elementary school, I don't even think we had libraries. Um, it wasn't really until I got to high school that my school had a library, and that's mostly where I went for detention. Um, but you know, now uh, Jill McMahon and I toured a, a number of schools that architectural candidates had renovated or built. The libraries are these spectacular spaces, very, very flexible, a lot of technology, a lot of light, um, areas where kids can learn in small groups with teachers, can learn on their own, um, and really bringing uh, the libraries in these three elementary schools up to those kind of standards. Um, next slide is, as I noted, right-sizing classrooms. Um, we really need to optimize the classrooms for the class sizes. In some cases, you have classrooms, it was noted by one or two of the architects, you have classrooms that are below state standards in terms of size. Um, so in some cases, we need to right size the classrooms. Um, also the classrooms in some cases, especially as you get to some of the older grades, um, the, the teachers are using the classrooms differently um, than they have historically. They need to have some more flexibility for the way that they teach. They move around a lot. The kids collaborate. They're in small groups. Um, and the it's not just, you know, again, when I was in elementary school, you had rows of desks and a teacher up front with a blackboard. Now it's much more of kind of a dynamic environment. Um, and also to create some consistency in terms of having comparable size classrooms across all of the elementary schools so that um, there's a certain degree of, of equity across all the schools. Um, part of that ties into enrollment projections. Um, and right now, the, the idea is, if I understand it right, and I'm not the expert, Jill briefed me on this, and she's very much the expert in this area, um, is that the Board of Education and the school district model high, medium, and low enrollment 
over an eight year period. And what we're gonna be designing for um, as part of these renovations is the high end of these eight year projections. Um, and part of that is because that's what the state wants us to do when we seek grant money from the state is to is to project at the high end and thus you know ask you know ask for the most amount of space. Um, and right now, in terms of our projections, we're in line with the state policy of modeling for eight year enrollment. The high end enrollment, just so people have the figures if they want them, um, are expected to occur in 2030, 2031, and that's 501 students at Hinley, 468 students at Holmes, and 416 at Royal. So those are the those are the numbers that um, our design professionals are going to be working toward as they design the renovated schools. Um, next slide. Again, I talked about systems. Um, a big, big part of this project is going to be the stuff that people don't see, right? The libraries are going to be great. The new classrooms are going to be great. Um, but a lot of the stuff you're not going to see, and that's going to be um, new air, new heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. All the schools are going to have air conditioning installed in them. None of them have air conditioning currently. Um, there's going to be new upgraded electrical put into the schools to support more technology. There's going to be expanded Wi-Fi. There's going to be converting the lighting to 100% LED. Um, the roofs on all the schools, while this project is not going to incorporate solar, um, what is going to be done is the roofs on all the schools are going to be designed to be able to receive solar if that decision is made down the road. So they'll be they'll be adaptable for that. Um, a lot of this is going to result in operating efficiencies, right? That's that's kind of the plan. In some of these cases, I think in Royal, for example, there are three separate heating systems: one like one steam, two fuel oil, and they've all been working. They're all fine, but it all they part of this project is going to be determining whether those get replaced or what can continue to be used um, efficiently. Um, shifting gears a little bit uh, to now to the individual schools, um, the Hindley project, so there's some facts and figures here. Uh, the common theme is you'll see demolishing the portables, um, taking down and building a new li library and new classrooms, renovating a number of the program spaces, some of which are moving to Oxridge, in particular the Developmental Learning Center. Um, as I said, upgrading a bunch of the infrastructure, um, and then some items that are still very much in the study phase when it comes to Hinley. Um, one would be possibly creating a traffic entrance and exit to route to route one. Um, obviously, there's a lot to be done in that respect, getting state DOT involved because it's a state highway, but that's something that's going to be studied, um, improving the bus loop. And then one of the things particular to Hindley is to try to determine what, what can be done, what should be done with respect to some drainage issues that have been raised where there's drainage off of the school property onto some of the adjacent properties. And so that's going to be studied, um, again, as part of the, the overall design going on at, at Hindley. Um, obviously, again, there's going to be a lot of different groups at the town that will weigh in on that, planning and zoning, Department of Public Works, et cetera. But that's going to be part of the um, overall project. Um, at Holmes, the next school, again, demolishing the classrooms, de demolishing the, um, uh, the portables, adding some classrooms, renovating but not replacing the library, upgrading the mechanicals, um, and on the study and to be determined side, um, again, possibly expanding some parking, looking at a parcel of property that is adjacent to homeschool that is called the Curtis property. Um, that's being looked at as part of the 
land surveys that are being done. Once we know what can be done with that property, for example, is it wetlands? What are the elevations? What are the grades? Um, we can then study more specifically what might be done with that property in terms of could it be expanded parking? Can it be more play area? Could it be um, used for outdoor learning? Uh, Royal, the third of the schools, again, common theme, demolishing the portables. Um, in this case, also demolishing and replacing the library, uh, building a new library, upgrading the infrastructure. This is the school where um, our architect has told us that some of the classrooms are undersized. Um, and again, here, looking at expanding the bus loop, um, possibly adding some existing parking. Um, shifting again to sort of the time frame and the stat and the status and where we are in the process before I um, before I turn it over to Dave. So this committee was put together in February of 22, so a few months ago. Um, the plan um, at this point is to start working um, even just later this week with our selected architect um, on beginning design, um, understanding the different approvals that are going to be needed. Um, there'll be the hard work over the, the course of the summer, this summer on design. Um, then at the same time, working through getting our state grant submission put together. Um, construction beginning in the June in June of 2023, with a goal to have construction finished so that the kids can move into this, the renovated schools um, in August of 2025. When I say move in, I don't mean to, I don't mean to create confusion. The kids will be in the schools while the renovation is going on. And a big part of what we're asking the architects and we'll be asking the construction managers to do is get everybody comfortable with how this project is going to be done around the, the kids uh, in the least disruptive way possible. Um, where we are at this point in the process overall is um, we've retained a consultant to help us with the state grant process. The state grant um, submissions are due at the end of June. We have retained an architect, the firm of KG and D, which will be um, our architectural professional. Um, we will be interviewing. We've sent out RFPs and received and, and have narrowed down the roster of potential construction managers to three. We'll be interviewing them tomorrow evening with a goal to select um, a construction manager by middle or end of next week. The construction manager will be working with our architect and with our grant consultant on the state grant um, so that that can all be submitted on, you know, on a timely basis for, um, for the end of June. What's key to understand is, is that when we go to the state, we have to go to the state with the full amount that the town um, has appropriated for the renovation of each of the three schools. It's treated as three separate applications. Um, the state needs to see basically the maximum amount that the town is willing to spend on these schools. Um, the state, assuming they approve that, then would ideally get us um, in front of the governor in December of 2022. Um, so that our appropriation and the state um, the state grant is then voted on in the spring of 2023. So Dave will go into the particulars, but the key thing to understand is we have to go, one, we have to go with the full amount of the appropriation. Two, based on the timeline I just described, we're going, we're, we're calculating that full appropriation um, on basically only the information that we have in front of us today, right? Which is conceptual drawings done by the architects and um, work done by our um, grant consultant and their, and their estimators, and obviously a ton of hard work done by Dave trying to review and reconcile those numbers. Um, so why don't I 
for now, um, why don't I pivot to Dave and let him talk through how we um, how we came up with the uh, the amounts that we're going that we have presented to the Board of Selectmen that we've presented to the Board of Finance that those two boards have approved that we then you know ultimately with um, the approval of this um, this committee would then go to the full RTM in June. Um, I'm going to interrupt for those who so are Dave. new to this committee. Um, Dave is returning, having served on this committee for a number of years. So we also welcome him back to uh, as an alumni of um, F and B. And I'm sorry for cutting you off, Chris, but we have some new members. Yes, yeah, no, not at all. Who are um, may have not known prior to him going to the dark side by joining the board of selectmen or the board of finance that he actually was on, you know, was was a Jedi here in our Um But David, take it away. And and I w would like to add that we love Dave back, um, but we don't forget that the criminal always returns to the site of his crime. So um, welcome back, David. And you can come back here any anytime you want. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bert. Appreciate it. And with that lead in, uh, I'll try I'll try to be fairly uh, fairly quick. Uh, the week before last, um, uh, we got uh, information from all three architects and our grant consultant, uh, ONG, and I worked with uh, Mike Lynch and, uh, and Jen Charneski on the soft cost uh, estimates for the projects. Uh, so the timeline uh, week before last was uh, we received the charrettes from the architects on Monday. We received their cost estimates on Tuesday. I uh, worked with Mike and Jen on the soft costs uh, in between on um, Thursday uh, afternoon. We got the estimates from uh, ONG, our consultant. And then Friday morning, uh, we, uh, as a committee, voted uh, on those numbers. So it was a pretty compressed uh, time frame. So what I will tell you is this. Um, the level of detail we got from the architects in terms of uh, their cost estimates, in terms of you know broken down detail by line item by component, uh, was not as thorough as what the folks at Oxridge had. Um, uh, there were significant differences in which costs were presented where, things that got presented in construction costs versus soft costs, depending on who was estimating. And there were significant uh, differences in the ranges for things like uh, contingencies and uh, escalations. So at the end of the day, uh, we felt most comfortable with the estimate that we got from ONG, uh, our grant uh, consultant. And uh, there are really four primary reasons for that. Uh, the first and foremost is the estimate from ONG contain the most detail uh, of the component costs by far. I mean, significantly more detailed than what we got from anyone else. Secondly, ONG maintains a separate database of uh, construction costs that they uh, compile for any project that they are directly involved in, that they are in, in terms of uh, bidding or other types of things. So they have actual, you know, I'll, I'll call them real costs, if you will, for projects that they've actually been involved in. Um, thirdly, is they have a separate group of people that only do estimates and they were charged with compiling their estimates without the benefit of seeing the architect's estimates. So they had to do it uh, completely uh, independently, uh, uh, which we which we liked. Um, I think you guys have the total cost summary chart that got sent around. It was a spreadsheet, um, uh, and what it showed was we took and we put by school the data from each of the architects broken down into construction costs and soft costs uh, by school and then came up with our estimates of the, uh, on the far right hand side uh, and um, where we came out was uh, we came out with a total of 76.75 million for the three schools put together 
Uh, so we slightly rounded each of the schools up, uh, just a small amount to get e the even amounts that you uh, have seen, the $26 million for Henley, the $24 million for Holmes, the $27.5 million for Royal, and that came to 77.5. You guys might have seen a prior estimate, our initial estimate that we got from ONG. I mentioned to you the timeline in the beginning was super compressed, and uh, Jack had actually asked me to do some comparison to the Ox Ridge project. And in doing that comparison, I noticed that there was uh, one section where the uh, individual line items did not match the subtotal. So when we got that corrected, that saved, uh, that, that ended up having a two and a half million dollar uh, lower number overall. Which I'm going to interrupt here because I will tell you that while I asked the question, having worked with Dave for a number of years, it just expedited when he would have found it anyway because he would have found it without my question. So I think he gives me too much credit, but I'll take it. All right, so so that's where we that's where we are with that. Um, a couple other things that you might be interested in is um, uh, in terms of a project like this, if you haven't been involved with one, which I had not been, is there are uh, contingencies for design. There's a construction manager contingency, and there's an owner's contingency. The construction manager's contingency and the owner's contingency in this this set of projects is exactly the same as it was in Ox Ridge, 3% for the construction manager and 5% for the owner's uh, contingency. Um, the design contingency is slightly higher for our projects, and that's you know partly uh, because there are three separate projects here. Uh, the designs might be slightly different from project to project. Uh, depending on you know the existing conditions in the uh, in the buildings and how the spaces need to be configured, and then the big the big one uh, as you could probably anticipate is the uh, escalation clause. The escalation, which is you know a reflection of inflation from now until the bid date for the contracts. Um, escalation for Oxford was four and a half percent. Uh, given the inflationary environment that we're seeing now, uh, the escalation clause is 8% uh, embedded into this contract. And I will tell you that uh, the uh, escalation is the 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 escalation is to the bid date because when we receive and accept a bid from the subcontractor, the subcontractor builds his own contingency into his contract. So there's no reason to duplicate it by having the, the escalation go beyond. Jenny, you look like you have a question. I do. Hi. Uh, can you tell me if the construction manager is being bid as at risk? Are they going to be yeah. setting a guaranteed maximum price? Yeah, um, they're being. Yeah, we're asking for a construction manager. The RFPs were for construction manager at risk. And then okay. we would then do a guaranteed maximum price contract with the selected CM. Great. Jenny, in the Ox Ridge project, project, they did a tremendous amount of work negotiating all that stuff. Rusty Steiner did an incredible job. And um, rather than start with the standard contract, we uh, expect to start with that contract uh, and go from there. Great. Thank you. I would note, I mean, I just one one thing just you know, Dave hit on this, which is the contingency and, and the slide that that is up on Jack's screen is the appropriate one to talk about, right? There's, there, the, we're gonna have to build in a fair amount of flex and contingency here because there's still a lot of unknowns. As I said, we're, we're calculating these um, appropriation requests based on the information that we have at the time, which is now, while we have a fairly clear scope and we have fairly detailed ed specs, the design is still very, very much at the early conceptual stages, um, you know there are some items that are pretty obvious, you know that we know about, um, but there's still things that could be uncovered as we get going. And this is the first, this is the first significant renovation that's been done in town to the school since 1996. Right, Tokenique was a new school, Oxridge is a new school, the high school is a new school. So 
you know, it's a little bit of uh, of a new experience doing extensive renovations like this. Um, and some of the things, you know, like I noted a little earlier, the curb cuts to do separate entrances off of Route 1 at Hindley or the drainage issues at Hindley um, or what we could or couldn't do with the Curtis property at Homes. Some of that stuff is still very much TBD. So um, that's why some of the contingency numbers are, you know, are what they are for a project like this. Another question on, um, I noticed that you got, that there was uh, added parking to Henley. Mm -hmm. You increased some spaces because they anticipate, am I right about um, there being an expectation about more bikes? Well, at Henley there, yeah, I mean, at Henley part of the, part of the, early stage conceptual designs was to create more bike space because Henley is a school that has a high percentage of the students arrive each day by bike. So they're yeah. going to expand some of the bike parking at Henley. Are they having e-bike chargers, charging stations? In 2030, um, e-bike? Uh, we haven't not... gotten that far T in the process yet, Jenny. TBD, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and can I ask a can I ask a question about the um, you said that the the people you ended up going with had much more clear cost analysis uh, based on their current construction projects or based on you know construction projects they've done are they current within the like a recent time frame given the dramatic escalation in the cost of materials? I believe that is, I believe that to be true, yes. Okay. Yeah, that would be an interesting question. What are their, are, what are their projects do they have in the pipeline and are they, are we competing for their time? Uh, they are, all, their estimate is they are our grant writing consultant. Um, they're actually working on the Ox Ridge project currently. Um, yeah, there's a CM for the Ox Ridge project. The, yeah, the, yeah. So, um, and they will be interviewed tomorrow for interest to be the CM for these projects. So, uh, I would be remiss not to give a short passing mention of the reimbursement potential for this project. The problem is, is I can't really give you anything like a reasonable reimbursement rate. I can tell you that for um, reimbursements on renovations and extensions and alterations or whatever the languages state use, they have a flat rate of 20.71%. And that ratio, that number gets affected uh, primarily by two things. One is there is a square foot, uh, methodology calculation per pupil per grade kind of thing and uh two of our schools will uh fall run afoul of that calculation and get reduced uh the reimbursement rate will get reduced uh, uh because of that uh and uh the other one is much harder to estimate uh which is there are eligible and ineligible costs and since we don't have anything near a final design it's really impossible to make anything like a reasonable estimate of what might be what might be deemed by the state to be eligible or versus ineligible. Um, so we believe we will be reimbursed, um, you know, to some amount. Uh, it certainly isn't going to be 20%, but it's certainly not going to be zero. Um, um, you know, if you don't mind, David, I want, to, I want to just clarify something. The square footage that we're talking about is they may say um, X number of students need 900 square feet and our buildings may have a thousand square feet. So that extra hundred is part that will not be reimbursed. But again, a position that was taken in Ox Ridge and I believe from some of the rest of us is um, while we have to comply with, at a minimum, with state requirements, we want to build schools that we believe is appropriate, even if it means that we lose some of our reimbursement. From a total appropriation, we're appropriating 77.5 million. That's the cost. 
However, Jen and I had a conversation earlier. One can easily expect at a minimum a three to four million dollar um, grant reimbursement. I believe Ox Ridge is about eight percent, and those funds will be used to um, to apply against some of the bonding out there, so we won't have to bond. And so we're going to get something, but the estimates that we're seeing right now, or if somebody's asking what's this costing, it's costing seventy seven point five million. Dave, oh, sorry I may, to cut you off. Yeah, D Dave, if I may ask, um, uh, what um, I I, uh, I understand that there is potential for solar installation. Is there any reason why we haven't looked? into that on a more concrete basis? And is that, uh, are there any programs that may be, may give us some offset um, for installing solar? Yeah, the, the, the solar programs in town have been run uh, separately. And uh, what our project intends to do is build the infrastructure into the roofs, cabling, conduit, those types of things to allow for solar ins installation. The solar installation projects, to my understanding, and Jack, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, are actually done by the town uh, in conjunction with the Green Bank. They're not done right. by the school district. Yes, so by, so can I, I, yes the, the town and state, a town and state initiative um, that's being looked at. That's but, correct. Okay, but thank you. There, there I, are, have a, I have a more fundamental question. Um, sure because some of the viewers may have that, um, they're taxpayers. Are we um, better off doing three renovations almost at the same time, or would we want to do one renovation at a time, learn from it, have the financial pain spread out over time, and... Um, and uh, avoid some of the big stuff that's happening right now. Is there any benefit uh, in doing it? Is there any um, benefit by having three, I mean, um, three schools being done at the same time? Um, does it help the financials or is there no impact of that? I don't know that that's really necessarily a purely financial uh, decision. Chris, help me out here. My yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think that's, I mean, it's it's an interesting question, Bert. I think it's, um, you know, I think we're sort of taking the charge that we were given, right, which was the, the Board of Education came up with the ed specs and the charge, which was to renovate these three schools and to do it simultaneously. So, I mean, that's kind of the the order we were given, and we didn't go back and say, well, gee, why don't we do them sequentially as versus simultaneously? Um, so we're while out, we did, we're not bidding out any of that to, you know, in a compact fashion, as to achieve economies of scale from any of the uh, uh, people who do the construction, right? <clears throat> I'm not sure I follow that. I think the idea, the 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 architect and the and the CM are part of the selection criteria is their ability and capacity to do all of these um, at the same time, and their and their fee estimates are based on doing it at the same time, and their staffing models are assuming doing it at the same time. So if, if you have a, a principle of two for one, or maybe in this case, three for one, um, are there any economies of scale by approaching this whole project holistically with all three schools? That's my question. There, there may very well be when it comes to, you know, purchasing materials, fabricating new HVAC things like systems, things like that. They very well, there very well may be economies of scale. I, Bert, I would think philosophically, and, and we can't talk because this is a new time with what's going on 
in the commodities and the supply um, distribution chain disruptions. But I would suspect that if I'm a CM and I'm bidding to do three schools, I'm not taking what it's going to cost me to do school one, two, and three if I had bid them separately and put in that for my bid. I'm going to assume that I'm going to have a lower price there because I'm getting this opportunity, which is a larger opportunity than going out to prepare and bid three different times. I also think on some of the materials, um, you know, if we're getting it in one place is a little ahead of the other, being able to move materials around from one location to another might be an option that helps us move forward. So ultimately, while I think, I, I do believe that a town-wide mistake was not approaching all of this on a more staggered basis. Um, they didn't, so here we are. Um, but um, I, I would hope that there are some economies of scale by doing all three. And hopefully the people that we're selecting are capable of doing that management. And if I may, I may be speculating here, uh, but but all of these portables have been a real sore spot in the town for a long time. And, you know, uh, I'm trying to pick ones which will be taken out in front of others. Um, I think it would be a difficult task. I think we want to get rid of them all as fast as possible. Well, but that's what I think was part of the problem of not doing this on a um, earlier basis of doing one and then doing the yeah. other and then doing the other because of the revolt that what we do to one school, we have to do to all schools at the exact right. same time or the hell freezes over. Um, right. So I think that that was a um, potentially a tactical mistake by the town, which may at this time be costing us some money. But that's just well, my personal opinion. But Jack, I, I can see how they do a holistic approach instead of a serial approach. Can yep. you imagine? What would happen if they do one school at a time and you bring up the um, parents of Hindley against the parents of Royal because one is waiting for the other project to be completed? So um, I, I, can I agree, Bert. That's what's happened here. And you're right. There would be a revolt in town. And um, whoever approved those and uh, the parents of the other schools would be out there tar and feathering all of us that didn't choose theirs. So well, I also you. think that you have, yeah, I mean, I also think you have, there just be, would be uncertainty, right? Because you would be making the grant applications in stat, you know, in, in conceivably three different years. Um, there'd be uncertainty as what you could or couldn't get from the state. Um, there, there, I, you know, there's. I, I do think there's efficiencies in doing it while the while the aggregate number is going to be higher. I think there's going to be efficiencies in doing it all at once. And and besides that, Chris, as you said, you know, you, we can't look back at what could have, would have, should have been done. The, this is your charge to do all three schools, and hopefully, when we when your team gets the bid in that there are some reductions, but you'll see that based upon the bids that you get from the final um, three right. finalists for each of this stuff. Right. Well, Jack, not quite, because I renovated my house in three steps. It turned out after the third one, it was obvious I should have taken the house down before <laughs> it even started. So that is something about the schools too, that people worry about, how much money are we sinking into these schools? And wouldn't it be cheaper to just do new start from scratch? Yeah, I, I think though that Chris covered that. And one of the things that about this school, some of these schools which are different than the California style schools that were Ox Ridge um, in the Northeast, which is cold, as opposed to the warmth of a California style school, which was our old high school in Oxridge, is that these schools really have good bones. And so, and they're, they're stacked differently. They're not that California style. So I think right. that's part of the reason why 
renovation was decided as opposed to knock down, start over. But anyhow, let's move on. Um, Iris? Um, yeah, and my question is, um, and it, it might have already been covered, but um, it might be for other listeners out there, is that, um, like, I'm not so concerned of whether we do them individually or we do them as three, but, like, it always seems that it comes to us when, like, there's no data under it. It's all, like, big question marks, and it's all, you know, good estimates, but, um, like, are we afraid the state's not going to have any money to gr give us a grant next year if we waited a year to get all of this stuff better finalized and we knew the numbers better? Well, I mean, I think the whole, essentially the whole project gets delayed a year, right? I, um, I know, but, you know, like then you're going to have better numbers because you're going to have maybe, you know, you appropriate some money to do the studies and you figure it out and then it all, like, it's all ready to go and you, you do it. I just, well, I think I think what you find is that a substantial amount of the costs uh, are the uh, architecture and pre-construction fees related to the design uh, and and bidding process. So the town would end up incurring uh, several million dollars in advance uh, with an uncertainty as to whether it would make any difference and you know potentially delay the projects another year. So, I mean, that's sort of a trade-off that you make. Yeah, and again, that's that's just, um, this is the timeline that, you know, we were asked to work with by the Board of Education. Um, you know, the, 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 that decision was made before the committee was even formed. So, um, it's not, it's, it, it, it's not an illegitimate, it's not an illegitimate question by any means. When I saw the schedule we had to work toward, that was kind of my first thought was like, holy smokes, how are we going to do this? Um, I just like to see the, the town, like, think ahead. Like, really? Yeah. We had to do this for Oxford. We had to have, you know, this magic number. We had, we've had just had to do it before. And I think it, it just behooves us to plan better. That's all I'm throwing out there. Yeah. I, I was I I very nervous to vote on all this money. Getting rid, and I don't even getting really rid know of what classrooms, especially, has been a priority for a long time. But, yeah, uh, but I, I get it. But it's just that I don't know. It's it's, it's not good budgeting practices. <laughs> it's just Iris. It's just that was there. my that was my point that I was making. That I think that overall, um, we did not do the planning for these schools, knowing that, I mean, four years ago, we took a tour of Royal and knew that classrooms are supposed to be 900 square feet at fifth grade. And we're in a classroom that's maybe six, uh, six or 700 uh, square feet. So again, it's something that we should think about, or the people who live in this town 30 years from now should think about because these buildings are supposed to last us 25 to 30 years, as Chris has mentioned, um, should be there. But yes, that was my point about if we had staged this or planned this better, there wouldn't have been such a rush. Um, it deals with some of the contingencies here um, that is really the thing that we can discuss and make sure that we're comfortable with the contingencies. Um, but the other thing that comes in is hopefully that the supply chain uh, disruptions gets better over the next two to three years, that commodity prices go down. As somebody said, um, I heard on one of the stations, um, one of the oil experts said, um, and I'm not saying this, but should the Putin regime not be there, oil prices would be cut in half in a short period of time. So there's a lot of other global things that are affecting this. Um, but over the next three years, while it's 77.5, once we get the grant, the issues are done and the management is done appropriately, we're, I would be hoping we're not spending 77. Yeah, and I mean, it behooves, us, it behooves us to manage that cost as best we can. Right? I, I just thought it needed to be put out there that it would be really 
helpful if people started planning ahead of time for big projects like this so that those of us who i mean i i have a construction background in accounting and you know it's just that the numbers it, it just makes me nervous to to vote on these big large numbers when i know it's a bunch of estimates <laughs> and there's no telling what will happen yeah. and i and I know there's always estimates and there's always contingency fees and there's always contingency cost in every contract, whether it's today, tomorrow, or 10 years from now. And so I just needed it put out there that I think that whoever started this started it way too late. And it, I think it should have been put out a year to get it the numbers better. But I'm not going to stop it. I just think it needed to be voiced. There you go. Fair enough. Fair enough. Charles, it looks like you have a question. Charles, did you have a question? I don't think your audio is working. Yeah, I can't hear you. Sorry, do you guys hear me now? Yep. yep. All right, so uh, what I wanted to ask was, um, so we've got the 77.5 as a current estimate. You know, we all know, I mean, you know, we could be unlucky and it could end up being 90. I mean, who knows, right? But But that does happen in construction projects. So what does the risk sharing look like between what we pay and what Hartford pays? Does Hartford participate pari passu in the in the in the overrun or or is is the risk ours? So if we go in and ask for a grant on the basis of 77.5, turns out to be 90, then arguably we should have gone in with a higher grant request to begin with. Uh, if it if it turns out to be 90, the town's not going to be paying that because we're anticipating that we're going to have a guaranteed maximum price from the construction manager. So our okay. price will be capped out by the guaranteed maximum price from the construction manager. Um, the uh, Hartford will review the amount that the town that the, Hartford is looking for the town to approve a certain dollar amount. And uh, the way that the grant process works is they basically come in and audit the process several times during the construction uh, to evaluate the actual prices uh, and reimbursement gets determined on that uh, subsequently. But the town's price will be capped out by whatever the guaranteed maximum price with the construction manager will be. Got it, thank you. I, I, I do wanna add to that because there are some little nuances here. Um, first of all, as was mentioned in Ox Ridge, there is sometimes a rider that if certain costs rise right. above a certain percentage, that a subcontractor can come back and say, hey, look what happened, and that can be um, renewed. Um, there's also a concern that we don't want to... Um, if, if we're finding costs to rise significantly, um, the example that I use is um, my younger daughter was the first freshman class in Darien High School. Um, because when we were taking down the old high school, as was common when they built those schools, asbestos was put into the cement of the auditorium that used to be on the side, hence the RTM had to um, increase their appropriation by two or three million dollars for the asbestos removal. And they also value engineered certain things out of that high school project, including such things as they had closets with no shelves. Um, but the most egregious was, um, as I said, my daughter was a freshman when she entered, um, about four years ago, they finally put in the auditorium, the sound um, quality that um, was supposed to be put into that auditorium to begin with. And just understand, my daughter's turning 32 this year. So it took us almost eight to 10 years to reinstate what we value engineered out to begin with. In an, um, Tokenique, we value engineered some cart out, um, which we needed for testing, which we then had to add back in and we didn't get reimbursed on the grant because of that. So while we want to make sure that this is here, 
um, we don't want this being value engineered down to the point that they have to come back and reinstate or rebuild some of these schools two to three years later. Um, so yes, I'd rather be that we're a little bit high. I'm rather that the contingencies are high. We have to trust that we have the um, at risk by the construction manager. Um, but we also have to be with the knowledge that if everything just blows up, I would expect the committee to come back to the various boards and the RTM to explain their situation, say we need a couple of million dollars more to do this right, and we address that at that time, as opposed to value engineering three million out and us spending 10 million to put the stuff back in later. So that's just a philosophy that some of us have in town, you know, um, going forward. So yes, we're going in at 77.5. I fully agree with Iris. That was my point. We didn't, I don't think the town plans this well, but this is where we're at. Iris, go ahead. Um, this is just a quick question along those lines on, on each of the schools, um, your little um, PowerPoint thing there at the bottom, it says the studies, you know, where you're trying to study the parking, the property, the whatever's in that study. Is the amount that is in the cost just for the study or is it for optimal usage of the studies? So like if the studies, let's say if the studies proved out, you can use the Curtis property, does, does the project dollar include using the Curtis product? project to a certain extent yeah because we don't know what we're going to use it for right i mean it would cost it would cost more to turn it into um building space or parking than it would to leave it as you know natural for example um so not not precisely but you know same like with henley there's there's amounts in there for things like expanded parking new traffic cuts dealing with the drainage but until we know exactly what that's going to entail we don't have specific numbers for it yeah i guess what i'm looking for is to to see if those studies are going to come out that then you're going to have to come back and ask for more money based on those studies that's not our expectation at this time to give you an idea for the henley uh project there's $3 million in the cost estimate for Henley uh, for basic site improvements and upgrades. So in, the three, in that $3 million, we're uh, anticipating that that would cover uh, the, the costs that we, or hopefully cover the costs that we expect to incur for any changes in the drainage system, the expansion of the bus loop, and uh, if, there's gonna, if there's gonna be a cut into the post road. Uh, when I talked to the consultants uh, specifically about the cut into the post road, uh, they said that the actual cost of the construction is not much. It's just the hassle of dealing with the state to get all the approvals and the timeline and those types of things. The amount of actual cost incurred to cut the curb, lay the asphalt, and those types of things is not that not that onerous. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out what's in your estimated numbers. Yes. So the, the short answer to your question is, yes, we hope so, because there's a, a large number built in for basic site improvements at each of the schools. And, and the hope would be that the studies come back and say we don't have to spend that much money. <laughs> uh, yes, obviously. The Curtis property does have one uh, huge adv potential advantage, which is if it turns out to be usable, it creates a uh, a fantastic place to use for the staging during the construction because it keeps all of the materials and all of the contractors away from the, the current bus loop uh, and away from the kids as much as possible. That will be one of the uh, uh, things. That, in fact, the architects all specifically address this, which is right. how are they going to manage the construction staging to keep it away from the bus loops, the parent drop-offs, and the kids as much as possible uh, because those sites are tight. So. Okay, thank you. 
Anything else? Uh, and I'll turn it back to you, Jack. Now, do, do you all have to vote to approve this to send it to RTM? Um, I apologize if yes, I don't have do. the, okay. Um, so I think they need to be done as three, if it's gonna be consistent with Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance, there are three separate um, appropriation requests. And um, that's how I have it listed. So, um, yeah, I've actually been treating this right from the beginning as three separate um, projects with the knowledge that the criteria on something like the eight year um, enrollment projections in that are um, relate to each school individually. And as such, the grants had to look at those criteria, each school individually, and as such, each of these projects have to be dealt with individually, although a construction team or how we bond, we can do however we feel. So um, I would like somebody to move 22. I should put on my glasses so I make sure I'm reading this right. Um, um, I need somebody to move 2215 appropriation bond authorization for the Hinley renovation for $26 million. Um, who's moving it? I have Peter moving it. I need a second. Second. Um, I have Iris as a second. Um, um, I'm gonna move really quickly. Are there any no votes? Are there any abstentions? Um, seeing none, it passes unanimously. Um, I need, did you get those who did what there, Jenny? Um, I need, uh, somebody to move 2216 appropriation and bond authorization for homeschool renovation of $24 million. I know who wants to do that first since it's her kid's school. So Beth gets to do it. Charles, I saw that your hand was raised in the prior one. So I'm going to have you as the second, if you don't mind. Um, are there any no's? Are there any um, abstentions? Seeing none, this passes unanimously. Um, I need somebody to move 2217 um, appropriation and bond authorization for royal renovation for 27,500,000. I have Barry there. I believe that was your school Second also, wasn't it? Was. Um, I, I was just I was just thinking if Deb Ritchie was here, she would definitely second it. Um, since no, that Brad was to second it because his kids went to Royal School. Uh, so who's seconding it? I'm sorry. You got that, Jenny? Who seconded? Sure. Okay, great. Are there any uh, no votes? Are there any abstentions? Seeing none, it uh, passes unanimously. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Chris and um, David, we will talk because I do believe um, mm -hmm. It's going to be F and B. Well, F and B will be introducing um, each of the three motions. But when we do the first one, we're going to give some overviews, talk about grants, talk about the contingencies that are built in, so that we can, um, at least in the report, address some of the financial questions that have been asked at the Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, and this committee. Um, and then education will talk about that one school. Um, and then you guys do the um, presentation, um, after which we'll open it up for questions, at least on the first school. And then we'll do the other three where um, on the other two, f and is just going to talk about, here's what this is, here's the issuance course, here's what we're expecting the average. Um, on the first one on Hinley, we will also, and f and be reporting on debt. So some of the earlier conversation we had with Jen will be discussed at that time, including the slide of what's going on, how it affects our AAA rating, and then the other two will be much shorter, at least from F and B's perspective. In the meantime, thank you both very much for giving up yet another one of your um, evenings to um, go through all of the various levels of dog and pony that this town requires you to do to um, complete these projects.
Well, um, thank you, everybody, for your time tonight. We appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you, guys. Okay, so now we can move on to the next things that we have. Um, we have three items for that are the completion of the fiscal 23 budget. The first is the um, item 2218, the 2022 sidewalk repair and replacement project. Um, that project came in at 750,000 for the um, 750,000 for um, um, I can't see people. I'll view everyone. Everyone. Oh. I'm having problems with my screen, but that's all right. It's um, sidewalk repair and replacement project. 752. Yeah, I have that. So, Jenny, just um, I need somebody to move that. Um, yell out who it is so Jenny has it. Um, and then um, I need a second. So, who's moving it and who's seconding it? Iris can move it and Barry will second. Thank you. Um, are there any no votes? Uh, is there any discussion on this? I mean, we've been um, bonding our sidewalks for a little bit of time. That was um, the program. It's one of the things that, based upon what might be coming down the road, I'm going to be asking the Board of Finance to possibly reconsider. Um, but um, so there, is there any discussion on these um, items? Haven't we had this discussion before? Yeah, we did, but I have to ask that. That's you know part of. It. It's like a little checklist. Did you it's like ask a little circular that? reference? Yeah, right. Well, just, <laughs> just to be straight on that, there's the one question is, um, are these uh, valuable projects? And certainly they are. And the second question is, should they be bonded? Should they should we borrow against um, these projects? And I think. I'm positive on both of these issues because I happen to have been on the Pedestrian Infrastructure Advisory Committee seven years ago, spent a quite amount of time on it, and found that Darien really needs to do much about their sidewalks. So I would move that um, uh, this is an, uh, an important um, consideration for uh, finance and budget and for the RTM, uh, because it really does add to the value of our town and the real estate we own in this town. Yeah, I agree with you, Bert. Um, so um, I'm gonna go through, are there any no votes? Um, seeing none, are there any abstentions? Seeing none, um, the um, it, therefore it passes unanimously. Um, I, I know there's an abstention, but I'm not getting it. Um, well, I need somebody to move um, 2219 sidewalk installation project of 120,375, the incremental cost is the issuance cost of $375. Um, do I have somebody moving that? Um, I Can somebody move this thing? Okay, I, I can see move Beth. it. I just advocated for it. I'd be happy to move for it. I'm going to give you a second, Bert, on that one. Okay. Are there any no votes? Are there any um, abstentions? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. Uh, 2220 um, is the Darien High School track and jump areas. The project is originally for 450000 with um, $1,110 being issuance cost. Um, we actually do have um, a calculation that I will pass around to everyone. I think I might have actually given it to you. In our report, we will be reporting what the incremental um, debt service cost 
is as an estimate, um, Jenny was kind enough to um, um, generate all those reports after she had a wonderful weekend watching her daughter graduate from college. Um, so um, yeah, no joke. Um, the last one too, if I recall, uh, you know, without going to graduate school. So um, that's always a... Um, Please bite your tongue. <laughs> Uh, so, um, do I have somebody moving 20, uh, to 20? I have James moving. I have Barry seconding. Is there any no votes? Um, seeing none. Are there any abstentions? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. By the way, if somebody abstains, it still passes unanimously. So it wouldn't matter that I'm saying that. Um, the second to last item on the agenda is... We're not going to deal with it tonight because this meeting's running long enough as it is. But one of the things that I want to do is have a conversation of how the Board of Selectmen, Board of Ed, Board of Finance on RTM, including F&B, can improve the budget process. Definitely with the project that cannot be named um, coming down the road, there is going to have to be some um, areas. Um, the Board of Finance has already uh, said in their meeting that they're going to be spending the summer defining some of the ground rules for the guidance. They're going to be meeting with the um, two Board of Selectmen and Board of Ed before to discuss with the guidance and then give the rationale. With a little bit of um, cover for our new chair, we should recall that the um, uh, he took his position in November and had basically one month to give guidance on what those boards were, which is at the same time organizing the new board. So, um, but there's other things. The report that we did um, on showing what the core increases were versus what the growth was, um, that report with identifying what the drivers are, what these projects are, and listing those out and coming out to a percentage um, is something that I think both of those boards should be making. Um, there's certain things on debt that we should consider. Um, uh, again, um, understanding the relationship between the unassigned fund balance and um, what happens. So as our debt goes up or if items went in instead of being bonded, had to be paid through taxes, that in fact lowers the percentage that we would have had in the unassigned fund balance, which would have lowered the amount that could have been contributed um, from fund balance to pay for some of these things um, and thereby increasing taxes as well. So, you know, it's the, um, all the connections that are there um, have to be related and definitely should we go for the project, report on the project that cannot be named at this time, um, we're going to be the lead on that and that's going to be a good part of our conversation. Um, because we want everybody to go in with open eyes on what the costs associated with the next one are. So please give some thought how we can do things better, um, how you think some of the boards can do things better. Um, I think education made a very good suggestion on providing some context to cuts that they're doing, how people can request for a general cut versus um, going specific line by line. Um, so I think all of those are um, appropriate. Um, my goal is, is that sometime after our September meeting, um, we go to the um, operations board and present an open letter to all of the boards with our suggestions for the upcoming budget year. Um, I think we've done a good job some of the stuff that we've um, suggested over the past are there. The listing of all of the reserve accounts are now in the back of the budget book. They used to not be there. Some of the cleanup of the um, various reserve funds um, aren't there, which um, are being done now, um, which weren't done before. The Board of Finance looks at closing out capital projects twice a year. Um, uh, instead of just once and then waiting another 12 months to get that in. 
Um, so there's a lot of things that this committee has done. I still think that there's more improvement that we can have and um, interested in everybody's input. Um, after Jack, that, we, Jack, yep. I mean, if you mentioned that, I mentioned that the um, water finance guidance for the other two boards, is it outrageous to think that maybe the finance and budget has some guidance to the other, to the three boards? Since we are the people who are in touch with the taxpayers more than anybody, RTM is really representing the taxpayers. Is there, you know, some notion that we uh, will, before the Board of Finance has a guidance, will ourselves uh, pronounce a guidance for the next budget? Just a thought. <clears throat> I think if we do, we would have to do some of the same things that um, we're suggesting, which is having a conversation with like um, the town administrator or the uh, chairman of the Board of Ed, um, the superintendent and um, their CFO, because like I know going into next year, we're going to need another fire alarm inspector. We potentially need somebody at the senior center. And there's a potential that there'll be an extra FTE in the health department based upon the developments that are going on. Um, we know that, um, you know, they knew very early on that the health care was being blown out of the water. Um, both boards did. And so guidance can't just be, oh, we like 3% because that's a good number or we want things tight. I think it has to be partially. Um, based upon what they know that's going on in their business. I mean, and and communicating with them to then say, okay, if you're gonna grow here, what are we taking away on the other side? I mean, one of the things that I hear when we're talking about the three schools is that every year we have an electrician go from classroom to classroom because certain students need to have air conditioning and the electrical outlets aren't um, capable of handling that. So during the summer, we've been paying for our team going in there and changing the electronics. Or when they change the three boiler systems into a single boiler system, is there cost savings there? Similar to we're now going 60% of the lighting is an LED. So what's the cost savings there? Um, and so those are some of the things that is being done to increase the efficiency. Well, when these come back in, we want to make sure that those efficiency have been accounted for and in that budget reduced. So, Bert, yes, but um, we should figure out how to do that. And so that's why we can spend some time this summer, think about it, and we'll deal with it and go from there. But any other thoughts on that? Okay, so we got two minutes outstanding. We have a minute from, I believe, April 6th and sometime in May. I forget what date that it was. Was it the third or something along those lines? Okay. Um, Jenny, were you able to um, confirm the attendees? I didn't. I just need to hear, but I wasn't at the May 3rd meeting, and I think I could gather who all was present, but if I, if you could check your minutes and make sure I have the attendance right, that would be great. I can't see it when I go back and watch it on Vimeo. I can't because the video cuts off. So if everybody, let me just pull it up and see if people, I'll take a quick attendance from the May 3rd meeting. Hang on. Give me a second. Da, da, da. All right, just can anybody, uh, was Mark wasn't there. Barry, were you there last time? I was not there. Okay, so. and Martha, Louisa were there, Jack was there. James Howe, were you there last time? He was not. I can see, I can read his lips. Okay, so <laughs> was there. I, I was not, there. sorry. <laughs> okay, I have Beth, Iris, and Peter were there. Um, Myself and Bill were not there. Bert was there and Charles was there. Yes? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so it's right. We don't have to change it. Okay, super. 
So um, can I have somebody move to approve the minutes of April 6th? Um, I have James and Barry is the second. Um, even if you aren't there, you can still vote on this. I see no no votes. I see no abstentions. This is unanimously. Um, can I have somebody move the minutes, approval of the minutes from May 3rd? I have Iris um, as moving it. I have Beth. I see only part of her hand, but I'll take that um, from um, as a second. I see no no votes. I see no abstentions. Hence, it passes unanimously. I want to thank everyone for their wonderful questions. I apologize for the longer meeting um, because we were doing really good in budget, you know, getting done with these things. Um, but with that, everyone have a absolutely wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Um, you know, um, enjoy, make sure that you're getting your beach sticker because it goes runs out on the 31st. So if you have one on your car, it's still good. But after that, um, send in your mailer um, or do it online as they're now doing. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Um, I have Peter, I have Barry. Um, I'm not even going to ask for no's and abstentions. Um, I'm going to assume it's unanimous. Um, everybody have a great weekend and thank you so much for your time and thank you for your budget work. Um, I now have to figure out how to end this meeting. Good night, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye.